So, Michael, you're out here three nights in a row. What are you looking for tonight? I'm looking for a nebula, Dad. Hey, can you tell me what a nebula is anyway? Well, Michael, a planetary nebula is a very hot star surrounded by an expanding envelope of ionized gases that emit a fluorescent glow because of its intense radiation from the star. Michael, I'd like to give you a better understanding. Let me begin by giving you the history of our planet and its origin. And here now, Michael, is how our local universe began. Earth is located in the Andronover Nebula. Our planet Earth and our Sun is one of the multifarious offspring of the Andronova Nebula, which was one time organized as a component part of the physical power and material matter of the local universe of Nebadon. And this great nebula itself took origin in the universe force charge of space in the super universe of Orvaton long, long ago. At the time of the beginning of this recital, the primary master force organizers of paradise had long been in full control of the space energies which were later organized as Andronova Nebula. Nine hundred and eighty seven billion years ago, Associate Force Organizer and then acting inspector number 811,307 of the Orvaton series, traveling out of Uversa, reported to the Ancients of Days that space conditions were favorable for the initiation of materialization phenomena in a certain sector of the then easterly segment of Orvaton. 900 billion years ago, the Uversa archives testify there was recorded a permit issued by the Uversa Council of Equilibrium to the Super Universe Government authorizing the dispatch of a force organizer and staff to the region previously designated by the inspector number 800,011-307. The Overton authorities commissioned the original discoverer of this potential universe to execute the mandate of the Ancients of Days calling for the organization of a new material creation. The recording of this permit signifies that the force organizer and staff had already departed from Uversa on the long journey to that easterly space sector where they were subsequently to engage in those protracted activities which would terminate in the emergence of a new physical creation in Orvaton. 875 million years ago, the enormous Andronova Nebula number 876,926 was duly initiated. Only the presence of the force organizer and the liaison staff was required to inaugurate the energy world which eventually grew into this vast cyclone of space. Subsequent to the initiation of such nebula revolutions, the living force organizers simply withdraw at right angles to the plane of this revolutionary disk, and from that time forward, the inherent qualities of energy ensure that the progressive and orderly evolution of such a new physical system. At about this time, the narrative shifts to the functioning of the personalities of the super-universe. In reality, the story has its proper beginning at this point. At just about the time the Paradise Force organizers are preparing to withdraw, having made the space energy conditions ready for the action of the power directors and physical controllers of the super-universe of Orvaton. All evolutionary material creations are born of circular and gaseous nebulae, and all such primary nebulae are circular throughout the early part of their gaseous existence. As they grow older, they usually become spiral, and when their function of sun formation has run its course, they often terminate as clusters of stars or as enormous suns surrounded by a varying number of planets, satellites, and smaller groups of matter, in many ways resembling our own diminutive solar system. Eight hundred billion years ago, the Andronova creation was well established as one of the magnificent primary nebulae of Overton. As the astronomers of nearby universes looked upon out this phenomenon of space, they saw very little to attract their attention. Gravity estimates made in adjacent creations indicated that space materializations were taking place in Andronova regions 
But that was all. 700 billion years ago, the Andronovus system was assuming gigantic proportions and additional physical controllers were dispatched to nine surrounding material creations to afford support and supply cooperation to the power centers of this new material system which was rapidly evolving. At this distant time, all the material bequeathed to the subsequent creations were held within the confines of this gigantic space wheel which continued ever to whirl and after reaching its maximum diameter to whirl faster and faster as it continued to condense and contract. 600 billion years ago, the height of the Andronova energy mobilization period was attained. The nebula had acquired its maximum mass. At this point, it was a gigantic circular gas cloud in shape, somewhat like the flattened superoid. This was an early period of differential mass formation and varying revolutionary velocity. Gravity and other influences were about to begin their work and converting space gases into organized matter. The enormous nebula now began gradually to assume the spiral form and to become clearly visible to the astronomers of even distant universes. This was the natural history of most nebulae before they began to throw off suns and start upon the work of universal building. These secondary space nebulae are usually observed as spiral phenomena. And the nearby students of that faraway era, as they observed this metamorphosis of the Andronova Nebula, saw exactly what you, Michael, and other 20th century astronomers would see when they turned their telescopes spaceward and view the present age spiral nebulae of adjacent outer space. About the time of the attainment of the maximum mass, the gravity control of the gaseous content commenced to weaken and there ensued the stage of gas escapement, the gas streaming forth as two gigantic and distinct arms which took origin on opposite sides of the mother mass. The rapid revolutions of this enormous central core soon imparted a spiral appearance to those two projecting gas streams. The cooling and subsequent condensation of portions of these protruding arms eventually produced their knotted appearance. These denser portions were vast systems and subsystems of physical matter whirling through space in the midst of the gaseous clouds of the nebula while being held securely within the gravity grasp of the mother wheel. But the nebula had begun to contract and the increase in the rate of revolution further lessened gravity control and ere long the outer gaseous regions began actually to escape from the immediate embrace of the nebula nucleus passing out into space on circuits of irregular outline returning to the nuclear regions to complete their circuits and so on. But this was only a temporary stage of nebula progression. The ever increasing rate of whirling was soon to throw enormous suns off into space on independent circuits. And Michael, this is what happened in Andronova ages upon ages ago. The energy wheel grew and grew until it attained its maximum of expansion and then when contraction set in, whirled on faster and faster until eventually the critical centrifugal stage was reached and the great breakup began. 500 billion years ago, the first Andronovus sun was born. This blazing streak broke away from the mother gravity grasp and tore out into space on an independent adventure in the cosmos of creation. Its orbit was determined by its path of escape. Such young suns quickly became spherical and started on their long and eventful careers as the stars of space. Excepting terminal nebular nucleuses, the vast majority of Overton suns have had an amalgamous birth. These escaping suns pass through varied periods of evolution and subsequent universe service. 400 billion years ago began the recaptive period of the Andronova Nebula. Many of the nearby and smaller suns were recaptured as a result of the gradual enlargement and further condensation of the mother nucleus. Very soon there was inaugurated the terminal phase of nebula condensations, the period which always precedes the final segregation of these immense space aggregations of energy and matter. Three hundred billion years ago, the Andronova solar circuits were all well established and the nebulous system was passing through a transient period of relative physical stability. About this time, the staff of Michael arrived on Salvington and the Universal Government of Orvaton extended physical recognition to the local universe of Nebadon. 
200 billion years ago witnessed the progression of contraction and condensation with enormous heat generation in the Andromeda central cluster, or nuclear mass. Relative space appeared even in the regions near the central mother-sun wheel. The outer regions were becoming more stabilized and better organized. Some planets revolving around the newborn suns had cooled sufficiently to be suitable for life implantation. The Ola inhabited planets of Nebadon date from these times. It is at this time the completed universe mechanism of Nebadon first begins to function and Michael's creation is registered on Uversa as a universe of inhabitation and progression mortal ascension. 100 billion years ago the nebula apex of condensation tension was reached. The point of maximum heat tension was attained. This critical stage of gravity heat contention sometimes lasts for ages but sooner or later heat wins the struggle with gravity and the spectacular period of sun dispersion begins and this marks the end of the secondary career of a space nebula. The primary stage of a nebula is circular, the secondary spiral. The tertiary stage is that of the first sun dispersion while the quartan embraces the second and last cycle of sun dispersion with the mother nucleus ending either as a globular cluster or as a solitary sun functioning as a center of a terminal solar system. 75 billion years ago this nebula had attained the height of its sun family stage. This was the apex of the first period of sun losses. The majority of these suns have since possessed themselves of extensive systems of planets, satellites, dark islands, comets, meteors, and cosmic dust clouds. Fifty million years ago this first period of sun dispersion was completed. The nebula was fast finishing its tertiary cycle of existence during which it gave origin to the 800,776, 926 sun systems. Twenty-five billion years ago witnessed the completion of the tertiary cycle of nebula life and brought about the organization and relative stabilization of the far-flung starry systems derived from this planet nebula. But the process of physical contraction and increased heat production continued in the central mass of the nebula remnant. Ten billion years ago the Quartan cycle of Andronova began. The maximum nuclear mass temperature had been attained. The critical point of condensation was approaching. The original mother nucleus was convulsing under the combined pressure of its own internal heat condensation tension and the increasing gravity tidal pull of the surrounding swarm of liberated sun systems. The nuclear eruptions which were to inaugurate the second nebula sun cycle were imminent. The quartan cycle of nebula existence was about to begin. Eight billion years ago the terrific terminal eruption began. Only the outer systems are safe at the time of such a cosmic upheaval and this was the beginning of the end of the nebula. This final sun disgorgement extended over a period of almost two billion years. Seven billion years ago witnessed the height of the Andronova terminal breakup. This was the period of the birth of the larger terminal suns and the apex of the local physical disturbances. Six billion years ago marks the end of the terminal breakup and the birth of our sun, the 56 from the last of the Andronova second solar family. This final eruption of the nebula nucleus gave birth to 136,702 suns, most of them solitary orbs. The total number of suns and sun systems having origin in the Andronova nebula was 1,013,628,000. The number of the solar system sun is 1,013,000. 572,000. And it was at that time that the great Andronova Nebula was no more. But it lives on in the many suns and their planetary families which originated in this mother cloud of space. The final nuclear remnant of this magnificent nebula still burns a reddish glow and continues to give forth moderate light and heat to its remnant planetary family of 165 worlds which now revolve about this venerable mother of two mighty generations of the monarchs of light. Create a slide for the Earth solar system, the origin of Mon Matia, M O N M A T I A. 500 million years ago, our Sun was a comparatively isolated blazing orb, having gathered to itself most of the nearby circulating matter of space remnants 
of the recent upheaval which attended its own birth. This was a stage of local space for the unique origin of Mamadia, that being the name of our sun's planetary family, the solar system to which our world belongs. Less than 1% of the planetary systems of Overton have had a similar origin. Four and a half billion years ago, the enormous Angona system began its approach to the neighborhood of this solitary sun. The center of this great system was a dark giant of space, solid, highly charged, and possessing tremendous gravity pull. The five inner and outer planets soon formed in miniature from the cooling and condensing nucleuses in the less massive and tapering ends of the gigantic gravity bulge when Angona had succeeded in detaching from the Sun while Saturn and Jupiter were forming from the more massive and bulging center portions. The powerful gravity pull of Jupiter and Saturn early captured most of the material stolen from Angona as a retrograde motion of certain of their satellite bears witness. The gas contraction nucleuses of the other ten planets soon reached the stage of solidification and so began to draw to themselves increasing quantities of the meteoric matter circulating in nearby space. The worlds of the solar system thus had a double origin, nucleuses of gas condensation, later on augmented by the capture of enormous quantities of meteors. The planets do not swing around the sun in the equatorial plane of their solar mother, which they would do if they had been thrown off by solar revolution. Rather, they travel in the plane of the Angona solar extrusion, which existed at a considerable angle to the plane of the sun's equator. In the planet-forming era, subsequent to the birth of the solar system, a period of diminishing solar disgorgement ensued. Decreasingly, for another 500,000 years, the sun continued to pour forth diminishing volumes of matter into surrounding space. But during these early times of erratic orbits, when the surrounding bodies made their nearest approach to the sun, the solar planet was able to recapture a large portion of this meteoric material. The planets near the Sun were the first to have their revolution slowed down by tidal friction. Such gravitational influences also contribute to the stabilization of planetary orbits while acting as a break on the rate of planetary axial revolution, causing a planet to revolve ever slower until axial revolution ceases, leaving one hemisphere of the planet turned towards the Sun or a larger body, as is illustrated by the planet Mercury and by the Moon, which always turn the same face towards Earth. Four billion years ago witnessed the organization of the Jupiter and Saturn systems, much as observed today except for their moons, which continued to increase in size for several billion of years. In fact, all the planets and satellites of the solar system are still growing as a result of continued meteoric captures. Three and a half billion years ago, the condensation nucleuses of the other ten planets were well formed and the cores of most of the moons were intact. Though some of the smaller satellites later united to make the present day larger moons, this age may be regarded as the era of planetary assembly. Three billion years ago, the solar system was functioning much as it does today. Its members continued to grow in size as space meteors continued to pour in upon the planets and their satellites at a prodigious rate. About this time, our solar system was placed on the physical registry of Nebadon and given its name, Monmadia. Two and a half billion years ago, the planets had grown immensely in size. Earth was a well-developed sphere, about one-tenth its present mass, and was still growing rapidly by its meteoric accretion. All of this tremendous activity is a normal part of the making of an evolutionary world on the order of Earth and constitutes the astronomic preliminaries to the setting of the stage for the beginning of the physical evolution of such worlds of space in preparation for the life adventures of time. Throughout these early times, the space regions of the solar system were swarming with small disruptive and condensation bodies, and in the absence of a protective combustion atmosphere, such space bodies crashed directly on the surface of Earth. These incessant impacts kept the surface of the planet more or less heated, and this, together with the increased action of gravity as the sphere grew larger, 
began to set in motion those influences which gradually caused the heavier elements, such as iron, to settle more and more toward the center of the planet. Two billion years ago, the Earth began decidedly to gain on the moon. Always had the planet been larger than its satellite, but there was not so much difference in size until about this time, when enormous space bodies were captured by the Earth. Earth was then about one-fifth its present size and had become large enough to hold the primitive atmosphere which had begun to appear as a result of the internal elemental contest between the heated interior and the cooling crust. One and a half billion years ago, the Earth was now two-thirds its present size while the Moon was nearing its present mass. Earth's rapid gain over the Moon in size enabled it to begin the slow robbery of the little atmosphere which its satellites originally had. Volcanic action is now at its height. The whole Earth is a veritable fiery inferno, the surface resembling its earlier molten state before the heavier metals gravitated toward the center. This is the volcanic age, nevertheless a crust consisting chiefly of the comparatively lighter granite is gradually forming. The stage is being set for a planet which can someday support life. The primitive planetary atmosphere is slowly evolving, now containing some water vapor, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen chloride, but there is little or no free nitrogen or free oxygen. Creator slide, the age of earthquakes the world ocean in the first continent. One billion years ago is the date of the actual beginning of Earth's history. The planet had attained approximately its present size and about this time was placed upon the physical registries of Nebadon and given its name Urantia. 950 million years ago, Earth presents the picture of one great continent of land and one large body of water, the Pacific Ocean. Volcanoes are still widespread and earthquakes are both frequent and severe. Meteors continue to bombard the Earth, but they are diminishing in both frequency and size. The atmosphere is clearing up, but the amount of carbon dioxide continues large. The Earth's crust is gradually stabilizing. It was about this time that Earth was assigned to the system of Satania, for planetary administration and was placed on the life registry of Norladia deck. Then began the administrative recognition of the small and insignificant spear which was destined to be the planet whereon Michael would subsequently engage in the stupendous undertaking of mortal bestowal, would participate in those experiences which have since caused Earth to become locally known as the world of the cross. 900 million years ago witnessed the arrival on Earth of the first centennial scouting party sent out from Jerusalem to examine the planet and make a report on its adaptation for a life experiment station. This commission consisted of 24 members embracing life carriers, Lanondek sons, Melchizedek, Seraphim, and other orders of celestial life having to do with the early days of planetary organization and administration. After making a painstaking survey of the planet, the Commission returned to Jerusalem and reported favorably to the System Sovereign, recommending that Earth be placed on the Life Experiment Registry. Our world, planet Earth, was accordingly registered on Jerusalem as a decimal planet, and the life carriers were notified that they would be granted permission to institute new patterns of mechanical, chemical, and electrical mobilization at the time of their subsequent arrival with life transplantation and implantation mandates. In due course, arrangements for the planetary occupation were completed by the Mixed Commission of 12 on Jerusalem and approved by the Planetary Commission of 70 on Edentia. These plans proposed by the advisory councils of the life carriers were finally accepted on Salvington. Soon thereafter, the Nebadon broadcast carried the announcement that Earth would become the stage whereon the life carriers would execute their 60th Satania experiment designed to amplify and improve the Satania type of the Nebadon life patterns. Shortly after Earth was first recognized on the universe broadcast to all Nebadon, it was accorded full universe status. Soon thereafter, it was registered in the records of the minor and the major sector headquarter planets of the super universe. And before this age was over, Earth had found entry on the planetary life registry of Uversa. The Earth's crust was highly unstable, but mountains were not in process of formation. The planet contracted under gravity pressure as it was formed. 
Mountains are not the result of the collapse of the cooling crust of a contracting sphere. They appear later as a result of the action of rain, gravity, and erosion. The continental landmass of this era increased until it covered almost 10% of the Earth's surface. Severe earthquakes did not begin until the continental mass of land emerged well above the water. When this once began, they increased in frequency and severity for ages, for millions upon millions of years. Earthquakes had diminished, but Earth still has an average of 15 daily. Eight hundred and fifty million years ago, the first real epoch of the stabilization of the Earth's crust began. Most of the heavier metals had settled down toward the center of the globe. The cooling crust had ceased to cave in on such an extensive scale as in former ages. There was established a better balance between the land extrusion and the heavier ocean bed. Volcanic eruptions and earthquakes continued to diminish in frequency and severity. The atmosphere was clearing of volcanic gases and water vapor but the percentage of carbon dioxide was still high. Electric disturbances in the air and in the earth were also decreasing. The lava flows had brought to the surface a mixture of elements which diversified the crust and better insulated the planet from certain space energies. And all of this did much to facilitate the control of terrestrial energy and to regulate its flow as it disclosed by the functioning of the magnetic poles. Eight hundred million years ago witnessed the inauguration of the first great land epoch, the age of increased continental emergence. Since the condensation of the Earth's hydrosphere, first into the world ocean and subsequently into the Pacific Ocean, this latter body of water should be visualized as then covering nine-tenths of the Earth's surface. Meteors falling into the sea accumulated on the ocean bottom, and meteors are, generally speaking, composed of heavy materials. Those falling on the land were largely oxidized, subsequently worn down by erosion, and washed into the ocean basins. Thus, the ocean bottom grew increasingly heavy, and added to this was the weight of a body of water at some places 10 miles deep. The increasing downthrust of the Pacific Ocean operated further to upthrust the continental landmass. Europe and Africa began to rise out of the Pacific depths, along with those masses now called Australia. North and South America and the continent of Antarctica, while the bed of the Pacific Ocean engaged in a further compensatory sinking adjustment. By the end of this period, almost one third of the Earth's surface consisted of land, all in one continental body. With this increase in land elevation, the first climatic differences on the planet appeared. Land elevation, cosmic clouds, and oceanic influences are the chief factors in climatic fluctuations. The backbone of the Asiatic landmass reached a height of almost nine miles at the time of the maximum land emergence. Had there had been moisture in the air hovering over these highly elevated regions, enormous ice blankets would have formed. The ice age would have arrived long before it did. It was several hundred millions of years before so much land again appeared above water. 750 million years ago, the first breaks in the continental landmass began as the great north and south cracking which later admitted the ocean waters and prepared the way for the westward drift of the continents of North and South America, including Greenland. The long east and west cleavage separated Africa from Europe and severed the land masses of Australia, the Pacific Islands, and Antarctica from the Asiatic continent. 700 million years ago, Earth was approaching the ripening of conditions suitable for the support of life. The continental land drift continued. Increasingly, the ocean penetrated the land as long finger-like seas providing those shallow waters and sheltered bays which are so suitable as a habitat for marine life. 650 million years ago witnessed a further separation of the land masses and in consequence a further extension of the continental seas and these waters were rapidly attaining that degree of saltiness which is essential to earth life. These inland seas would make it possible for civilization on Earth to begin. And the cats in the cradle and the silver spoon Little boy blue with the man in the moon When you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when We'll get together then, yeah We're gonna have a good 
time, baby. 